In my other videos, you can see I built a summer house garden room during lockdown that took me the best part of a year. In this video, we'll look at DIY solar systems and the three different types of systems that you can get, the system that I finally settled on, the components, the cost, and how I installed the system. And then we'll look at how much power uh, that my system produced and how I can monitor it. I hope you enjoy it. So we have three different types of solar setup. This one, let's start with this one, which is grid tie, no storage. This is one of the simplest ones you can get and is what I settled for in the end. And I'll take you through my setup in a while. So this consists of your solar panels, your string inverter and your consumer unit which then feeds onto the grid. So you've got DC coming out of your solar panels into the string inverter, and then that converts it to AC, which you can use for normal electrics, kettle, toaster, any house appliance. That's plumbed directly into your consumer unit by a qualified electrician. Um, and that just feeds all the, all the power that you can get from the sun into your consumer unit and then you can use that on all of your household items because it's fed into your consumer unit you can use it all around the house anything you just plug into any socket in the house and it will use as much power as it can from the solar and uh, pull from the grid what it what it can't get from the solar so let's say you you're boiling the kettle and you're currently using 500 watts in your house in your consumer unit and let's say your um your solar power is generating 200 watts of power at that moment but you need 500 watts it will use the 200 from your solar and pull 300 from the grid so you're saving 200 watts there now there are some pros and cons to every system. The pros to this system is it's very cost effective. It's the best return on investment. And you can add an AC coupler later, which allows you to add a battery. So this system isn't redundant if you later wanna add batteries. The cons is there's no storage for night use. So obviously you're only generating power during daylight hours and nighttime, nothing, system shuts down. During the summer, you're gonna get plenty of power on bright days, but in the depths of winter, December, January, you're not gonna get much at all. You're gonna get a couple of hundred watts if best during those very short, dark days. Next, we have grid tie with storage. So it's a slight variation on the previous one. So you've got your solar panels, your hybrid inverter, a battery, and then that ties into your consumer unit and, and off to the grid. So what this system does is generate power from the solar, it will feed into your inverter. So it's DC from solar panels into your inverter. And then it will convert to AC to go directly to your consumer unit. So you can use it as the grid tie with no storage, exactly the same as that. But you also have the added benefit of having a battery system on here, which will store your excess power. So whatever you're not using during the day on your household appliances from the consumer unit, it will store that energy in the battery for later use. So come seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, when the sun goes down and you're not generating any power from your solar panels, you can then, it will pull power from the battery and um, it will pull power from the battery. So you can then boil the kettle, use your lights, TV, anything will draw off of the battery because that feeds into your consumer unit as well. Now the pros and cons for this system, the pros are you can store and use energy at night because of the battery. You can utilize cheap night grid power to charge the batteries during winter. So as mentioned, you're not gonna get much solar power here in the UK. And on Octopus Energy, for example, they do very good and cheap night rates. So for example, here in the UK, it's just under 31 pence a kilowatt hour. And if you look at the night rate with Octopus Energy, they're currently doing 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour at night. And your day rate goes up slightly to just over 31 pence per kilowatt hour. So there's some really good savings there. If you use that time to pull power from the grid at 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour, charge your batteries, then during the day when there's not much solar, you can utilize the power in your battery 
when the power would cost you 31 pence a kilowatt, you can utilize that power in your battery. So it saves you a lot of money. The cons of this system is that the batteries can be quite expensive. It's quite an investment. Now, as you can see on this website, just to give you an idea that this 5.8 kilowatt battery is about two and a half thousand pounds. Now, a five kilowatt battery means that you can run 5,000 watts for one hour or 1,000 watts for five hours, for example, and that's just a very rough guide. So, although it can be very handy to store your unused power for later use, you need quite a significant investment into large batteries for them to be of any use. There are some DIY options available, especially this kit, as you can see here from Frogstar, that can get you significant savings on batteries. So this system is much more expensive and a longer return on investment. Brings us on to the third system, which is off-grid. So what this is, is a system which doesn't touch your consumer unit. It's totally standalone and consists of solar panels, a solar charge controller, your batteries, and then an inverter. This system, it doesn't touch your consumer unit at all. It's totally standalone. A lot of people use these for off-grid cabins, for example, or it's, this is the same sort of setup you'd get in a camper van. You can charge a battery, and then the inverter converts it from DC to AC, and then you can plug in, as you can see here, plug in your, your load, your laptop, light, fridge, freezer, whatever appliance you want into this standalone inverter. But this doesn't touch your grid. If you wanted to run your fridge off this, you'd run an extension cable off of your inverter that would run through your house and you'd plug your fridge into it or your washing machine or whatever. So the pros from this is it's completely standalone, no grid needed. And power when others have a power cut. So. If your street's got a power cut, you'd be the one who have still got your lights on via your extension cable, of course, because it's not off the uh, consumer unit. That's a handy thing if you have power cuts. Uh, cons, again, the batteries can be expensive. Also, it's on a separate circuit to the rest of the house mains. So that sums up the three main solar systems. I hope you found that useful. As I said in the beginning, the system that I went for was a grid tie, no storage, purely because you don't have to spend much money in the first instance. And I wanted to dip my toe in the water and learn about solar and didn't want to spend too much money before I figured out what I was doing. So I went for a grid tie, no storage, directly connects into your consumer unit. You use the power that you get from the solar panels and the rest is wasted. As you can see here, this is a Google satellite image of my house. Um, south is obviously facing directly down. Um, and as you can see, I'm slightly off of south, but it's still pretty good. I haven't got any large trees in the way or anything that could cause shadows. So I should get good sun coverage throughout most of the day. So where to put my solar panels? now? I'm not great with heights. I don't fancy climbing on top of my roof. So I've got a flat kitchen roof, as you can see here, where I thought it would be a good place to put my panels to start with, and then I can move them around later. If I wanted to put them up on the roof, if I got a bit more brave, I could put them up there at a later date. But as you can see here, that, that's where the, the flat roof is. I can get up there easy and it's got good sun coverage. What system did I go for? Looking around online, one of the best places I found that does good prices, good product, was City Plumbing. Free delivery, and they've got a store quite close to me if I need to do some returns. Also, they're doing 15% off first orders with their app, so it was a no-brainer for me. So what did I go for? I would have enough room for about four of these panels spread out across my flat roof. I decided to get four of these Longi Solar 405 watt panels, and you can see they're very well priced, 141, that's including VAT. So the inverter, after doing lots of research, talking to a very friendly guy called Michael on Facebook Solar Group, who helped me immensely in this project, I decided on a Solax single phase inverter. And this one you can see is two kilowatt, very reasonably priced, 335 pounds. Now with the four panels that I'm gonna get at 405 watts, that'll just give me 
1600 watts, 1 1.6 kilowatts. The maximum for this inverter is two kilowatts. Now with the inverters, you can overpower them. So I can provide more than two kilowatts of panels into this inverter and it would just cap it. Each of the inverters has a certain percentage of allowed over paneling. So if we take a closer look at the items that I bought and I'll break it down how much each one cost. We have the Solax X1 Mini 2K inverter at £335. We've got four Longi 405 watt solar panels at £564 for all four. There's a small AC isolator which allows you to shut the isolator off so you know that you're not getting any power coming from your solar panels into your consumer unit. And then some uh, PV cable. This is DC cable which goes from the panels to the inverter. And then just some wood for the frames. The total for this lot was £1,005 plus the 15% off which is your first order on the City Plumbing app. Comes in at £854. Now that's such a good price for a um, 2 kilowatt inverter and 1.6 kilowatt solar panels. So the first thing I needed to do was build the frames. So I got some treated two by two and went about building a frame that could hold these panels. I wanted each panel on its own separate frame so I could move them around on that flat roof and I could change the position if I needed to. I bought these right angled brackets which bolt directly onto the panel frame. And then I put some lengths of two by two and screwed those to those right angle brackets. That was the basis for my frame. These frames have got to be quite strong. You don't want them blowing off the roof. You want them really sturdy. The other thing is these panels are big and they're quite heavy. So getting them up onto my flat roof on my own is quite a task. So what I did was I got my ladder, as you can see there, and propped it up against the flat roof and then just pulled it up, being as careful as possible not to scratch the glass or crack it and yanked it up onto the roof. It can get very windy in the UK. So once the frames were built, I wanted to screw the frame to the back wall so that they're not going anywhere. And as you can see here, underneath this bedroom window, I've got a tile section. So what I did was bolt this four by two either side of the wall there, and then another section on the other side. I needed a good strong anchor point on that wall that I can screw the paneled frames to so that they're gonna be really sturdy in high winds and not go anywhere. The next thing to consider is the angle which your panels should be in relation to the sun. I'm quite restricted in the angle that I can get on my flat roof due to the height of the windowsill above my flat roof. Using the Omni calculator, you can see here on the left, I can put in my measurements of A, for example, which is my maximum height from the flat roof to the underside of the windowsill, which is 76.97 centimeters. And then the length of C, which is the panel itself, 114 centimeters. And then that will give you B, which is 84. And you can see the angle there is 42.465 degrees. Now, looking on the right-hand side, you can see the solar angle calculator. Just pay attention to the bottom. You can see the winter, spring, um, autumn, and summer. At the moment, we're in the height of summer. So during the summer, the sun is higher in the sky as it is to winter. You can see there that they suggest that the angle during summer should be 62 degrees to get the maximum power out of the sun. Spring and autumn is, the autumn is 38, and in the winter, it's a very low angle. Sun doesn't rise very high, is 14 degrees. So unless you're going to change the angle of your panels throughout the year to get the maximum out of the sun, then you want a sort of happy medium between them. And some people do change the angle of their panels a few times a year, but yeah, not something I really wanted to do. The maximum angle I could get was 42 degrees, so I settled on that. And on this solar angle calculator, you can see you just pick your country and select your town, and then it will give you that angle, which will be different depending where you are in the UK. 
So once I had my panels up on the roof, I decided to build my frames up there. I'd done all my measurements and cut the wood on the ground, put the wood up on the roof and bolted them, screwed them together up on the roof. If I built the frames on the ground, on the panels, I wouldn't be able to get them up there, just way too much, so I decided to do it on the roof. Very important to make these frames really strong. As I say, the winds can really get high. They can whip up underneath these frames. You don't want them crashing down off your roof and blowing over your garden. I wanted these frames to be mobile, so I can move them around slightly. So I wanted them on individual frames. I can bolt them to the beam at the back there to make them sturdy and they're not gonna blow away, but also have the ability to pull them forward and change the angle slightly. Here's a completed frame, and this cross section here would be pulled back to the wall. This whole frame would be pulled back to the wall and then screwed against the beam there so it's not going anywhere. Nice and sturdy. Once all four frames have been built, I then pulled them back to the wall here, then screwed them to the beam that was bolted to the wall to make them nice and secure. So the reason why I designed the frames like this with that cross section a little higher, I needed to get underneath the frame to be able to access the wiring and to be able to screw each frame to the beam. So now all the frames have been built and the panels positioned, now it's time to move on to the inverter. Decided to install it just under the eaves there. I bolted the bracket onto the wall and the inverter just slots onto the bracket there. Then I can run the DC cables to be nice and close to the panels and they just run up into there and then I can run the AC cable up into the eaves through the loft and then down into my consumer unit. Next thing is to wire the panels into the inverter. There are two different ways to wire your panels into your inverter. There's parallel connection and series connection. Now there's endless debates online about which one is better. And there are various pros and cons to each system that I don't really want to go into on this video, only to say that I settled on series connection. You can see here, I'm just putting the MC4 connectors on the end of these cables, so I can wire them in series connection. Once the MC4 plugs are on, then plug it up into your inverter, making sure that you get the connections around the right way. The PV cable I've got was red, so I put a bit of black tape around that one to indicate that that's the negative. And they just plug up into your inverter. And you can see here on the inverter, I've also plugged in the Wi-Fi dongle. Now all that side of it's done. The frames are built, panels are positioned in the correct angle, the inverter's on the wall, and the DC cables are all plugged up. The next thing I need to do is to run the AC cable out of the inverter to my consumer unit and then get my electrician in to wire that into the consumer unit. Here I used a bit of conduit that goes up into the eaves and into my loft and then I'm using a 2.5 twin and earth and you can also see an earth cable running there as well. There's a separate earth to the inverter. That runs through my loft and down through a cupboard in a conduit through the floorboards and comes out in my consumer unit downstairs in my office. And you can see it just poking out the top there, waiting for my electrician to come around and wire that in. You see near the bottom there, I've installed my isolator with the big red switch, and that's a lockable isolator currently in the off position. Any work at all in electrics in your house, safest thing to do is to shut the isolator off so you know that you're not getting any power coming from your solar panels into your consumer unit. Now that's all wired up, the system's on, and it's producing electricity. So how much power am I actually getting? Which brings us on to monitoring, so you can actually see how much power it's producing. Now the Solax inverter comes with this online Solax cloud application, which will tell you in real time how much power you're producing and holds onto the data so you can see how much you earned yesterday and the day before and last week and so on. In this view, you can see how much real-time power is currently coming into the system, how much you've generated today, and how much kilowatt per hour you've generated. So looking at this day here, for example, the 26th of the 7th, 2023, which was this day here, we generated quite a lot of power that day. It was 7.7 .7 kilowatt per hour. It was a sunny day with times of cloud. But you can also see here on the 24th, we only got 1.6 kilowatt per hour which was obviously a very rainy day, dark and cloudy. 
Now I run Home Assistant, which is a home automation platform for automating and monitoring various appliances and applications around the house, which I'll probably do some other videos on. I like a bit of home automation. So I set up my Solax inverter monitoring in Home Assistant to see how much power I'm generating, how much power I'm using from the grid and how much power I'm exporting to the grid. You can see I've done a time-lapse video here which shows the clock is down the bottom right and you can see it nine o'clock in the morning. I'm producing about 1000 watts and that's steadily going up. But then sun, cloud come over. This was a typical nice day, I would say, where you've got a lot of sunshine and some clouds. And you can see it's extremely variable what I'm getting there. On the, on the top one is the solar power I'm producing from the solar panels. The middle one is the grid import. That's what I'm currently pulling from the grid and paying for. Now the bottom one is the grid export, and that's the excess power that I'm not actually using from the solar at the moment. So for example, if my solar panels are producing a thousand watts of energy at that particular moment, and I'm only using 400 watts, then that bottom grid export is showing 600 watts that I'm actually not using at the moment. That's where batteries would really come in handy to store that excess power to use later when you really need it. Another panel I've set up in Home Assistant is this one here, which is the one I pay most attention to. The one in the middle, the orange one in the middle is the solar power. So that's how much the, the solar system is producing. The one on the bottom right that says home, that's how much I'm actually using in my house. So with my TV and my washing machine, fridge, freezer, computers, and so on, currently running at 597 watts. The one on the left has got two arrows, one pointing left and one pointing right. The arrow pointing right, the 22 watts, is what I'm pulling from the grid. That's what I'm paying. So right in this still image at the moment, I'm purchasing 22 watts from the grid. The arrow pointing to the left, when I produce so much solar that I'm not using it and it exports it, it pushes it back to the grid, the bottom number changes to zero and the top number will show me how much power I'm actually wasting away and throwing back to the grid. So if I run this in real time, you can see here, right at this very moment, I'm throwing away 30 watts. My house is consuming 560, 570. Solar's producing 624. I'm sure in a moment the cloud will come out and that will drop down and I'll start consuming power rather than producing it. You tend to get into habit of like, I'll put the kettle on if the sun's shining or my wife says, shall I put the washing on? I say, I don't know, is the sun shining? Wait till the sun's shining. So we used to put the washing on early in the morning. Now we put the washing on at about 11 o'clock on a sunny day. Hopefully the solar would cover most of the cost of that. The Home Assistant is a great piece of kit. I really must take some time to do some videos on this. If you hit the like and subscribe and the little bell, you'll get notified once I upload some more videos. So I hope you've enjoyed watching this video, what system I bought, why I bought it and how I put it together. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, hit the little bell. I'll try and upload some home automation stuff to show you how I put all that together as well. Thanks very much.